Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Dodd in for Troy Mulling this week. Thanks for joining us on Market Journal today. It's our last show of January and the year seems to be plugging right along, doesn't it? Well, kicking off today's show, for many producers, we're in calving season. While for others it's still a few months away, but no matter when it happens, there are some things that always need to be remembered. Nebraska Extension beef educator Aaron Berger joined Market Journal's Troy Mulling to offer some advice on what you can do to make sure you are prepared. As we think about that cow in her last trimester, specifically that last 45 to 60 days prior to calving, her nutrient requirements are really ramping up as that calf that's growing within her is taking a lot of nutrients as well. And so we need to pay attention to that. Also, if we've got cows out grazing on crop residue or winter range, need to also recognize that this tends to be the time of year when that forage quality is at its lowest. So we've got two things happening. We've got cows, nutrient requirements ramping up and we've got forage quality that tends to be towards the lowest in terms of what we have available to the cow. So really need to pay attention to that. We also have weather conditions where cold stress can really ramp up a cow nutrient requirements. So paying attention to cow body condition score, paying attention to what's happening with that cow in terms of her nutrient requirements, making sure that as best we can, she's in good condition prior to calving. And we'd like to see those running age cows, you know, somewhere in that mid body condition score five as they come into calving. First calf heifers probably would like to see in a six body condition score. Those things will help uh, those cows be in a good place, not only to help them have good colostrum, uh, cows in better body condition have tend to have better quality colostrum, and also just recognizing the nutrient needs that they're gonna have as they go into calving, they start producing milk. That's a really high time in terms of that cow's needs, so making sure they have adequate body condition is important. When it comes to facilities or calving supplies, what are some of the main things we need to know here? You know, I think as we move into calving, it's a good thing to do is go through your calving facilities, make sure gates, hinges, head catches, lights are all in good working order. Review your calving supplies. Do you have what you need on hand to assist a cow or a heifer at calving? I think it's also a good time to maybe touch base with your veterinarian. Uh, if you're gonna need to assist a cow at calving, it's also imperative that you potentially be able to provide some colostrum either by milking that cow out or a high quality replacement colostrum product. And so understanding from your veterinarian what some of those replacement products are and how they might help you meet the needs of that calf as we go through the calving there. And of course, winter weather always an issue. Was there anything we learned from last year's bad weather that can help us this year? in terms of keeping calves comfortable and safeguarding against any issues? Well, obviously 2019 was really challenging for folks calving in that late February through April time period, even into May, we had snowstorms in Nebraska. So obviously cold, wet conditions are very challenging for a newborn calf. And if we have a situation where calves get into that, uh, hypothermia can pretty quickly set in. So having a thermometer to be able to temp calves if they're cold stressed, know where they're at, and then reviewing what are some procedures that you have available to you to warm calves up. And that can be anything from uh, warm air, again, uh, getting some warm colostrum into that calf can help as well. Uh, in extreme cases, we may need to use a warm water bath and, and understanding some of the things that we need to do to that uh, with that to uh, get those calves warmed up and uh, get them dried off, get their body temperature back to a normal place cold stress calves are also gonna probably be potentially immunocompromised. And again, that's where the importance of colostrum and getting that colostrum to the calf in a timely way is gonna be important as well, just for the future health of that calf as it goes through its life. And Aaron, you've written that producers need to know their limitations and sometimes calling in a vet is one of the best things you can do, right? So as we think about assisting the heifer or cow at calving for Producers, they obviously have different skill sets and levels of knowledge and, and what their abilities are. So being able to review what are the stages of parturition, meaning what are the stages of calving, when is intervention warranted, and then also for the producer recognizing when they get to a situation where that situation or the condition that cow's in, the difficulty they're encountering is beyond their skill set and quickly contacting a veterinarian and getting that cow either to the vet or the vet to the cow 
where we can assist that cow. That's going to really improve the outcome greatly. A time is of the essence in this kind of scenario, and so waiting around, hoping that things are going to get better, probably is not a good strategy. Having some understanding of how quickly we need to act, again, those stages of parturition, and when there's a problem, knowing when to get a hold of your veterinarian and having them be part of the process will help to ensure better outcomes for both the calf and the cow. Thanks to Aaron. For more on calving, you can visit beef.unl.edu. Moving on, and another issue that may be impacting many producers is not getting enough sleep. In the winter months when there's less sunlight, sleep deprivation can be more likely to happen. The good news is, it can be fixed. But you have to understand what to do. Nebraska Extension's Susan Harris Broomfield joined Market Journal's Troy Mulling to discuss why getting a good night's sleep matters so much. Why is sleep so important, and in particular, so important in the ag industry? Sleep is one of the most underrated, easy ways to stay healthy that I think a lot of us don't take advantage of, especially those in the ag industry. Um, we have these crazy hours, especially during calving season, harvest season, taking shifts, sleeping two hours here, two hours there. Um, it's just not enough to do what sleep does, which is, um, you can think of it as this cleaning crew that comes in and sweeps all the toxins out of your brain and it sends a construction crew into your body to repair your, your organs, your heart, your muscles. Um, everything that's had trauma that day is getting repaired and fixed throughout sleep. And if you don't have that sleep time, um, you, your body's going to suffer. And especially, I think with farmers and ranchers, I'm really concerned about their cognitive issues. Um, there's this process called consolidation that when you learn something throughout the day, it's cemented in your brain with sleep. Without sleep, it's gone, most likely. You, sure. do, you don't remember things as well. And you're klutzier. You know, you, you don't have, you, you might be making decisions that um, aren't safe, that don't warrant safe behavior. So injury is a factor. Yeah, and that leads into my next question because I thought there were pretty, some pretty startling statistics. One s statistic you were talking about, uh, kids on farms are two to three times more likely to get injured. Any other statistics that uh, you want to share regarding sleep deprivation? Yeah, that statistic is specifically for adolescents. So that's something that I would love parents to, to consider in, in looking at their children and how many hours they sleep. We all think of eight hours as being the number, you know, um, but for our kids, it's way different. In that study, it said um, they are more likely to be injured unless they have at least nine hours and 15 minutes of sleep the night before. So kids need nine, preferably 10 hours of sleep, and the younger ones even more than that, while well, we can get away with a lot less than that. Another statistic that kind of blows people's minds is that being awake for extended lengths of time, like about 21 hours, is the same uh, mentally as having a blood alcohol content of 0 0.08, which mm -hmm. is the legal um, level for intoxication in Nebraska. That's pretty serious. And, and staying awake 24 hours, if you pull an all-nighter, an all it's, it's like you're wasted. Mm -hmm. So good advice is to not get into um, your tractor, not get into a vehicle. It's just not safe. And I would assume we're always talking about planting. We're always talking about harvesting, you know, uh, seed selection. So I would think when it comes to a healthy lifestyle in the ag community, sometimes getting proper sleep isn't taken as seriously as it could be, right? It's, it's a last priority. Why, why do you think that is? The work ethic. Uh -huh. You know, it's all about getting the job done. And as we grow up, we're not taught about sleep. We're taught about eating healthy and we're taught about exercising. But sleep is something that has never been discussed. And an interesting, another um, fact with sleep is that in the last 50 years, our length of time overall as Americans, sleeping has gone way down. We sleep an hour to an hour and a half less than we did 50 years ago. Mm. That's not that long ago. Yeah. And you think about the changes in our lifestyles and our connectivity, um, it, it's, it's, I, I think we can blame it on society. And you've mentioned this is your favorite topic to, to cover when uh, working with Extension. So you have a whole bunch of tips for people. What are some of the major takeaways that you want people to know so they can get that better night's sleep? I have researched this a lot and I've interviewed several experts on the topic and with each of those experts I asked them what's the number one takeaway I should give to my audiences and all of them without fail said the same thing and you're probably going to be surprised by this it's get up at the same time every day you know most people talk about our bedtime and since we were little kids we're, we're taught go to bed at your bedtime you have a bedtime 
Um, but really, to set that circadian clock in your body, it's more important to have a wake time, a consistent wake time. Um, it's, it's telling your body it's time to wake up and, and not sleep anymore. That's my number one tip. Um, the other two most important ones are probably about light and temperature. Mm -hmm. um, so many people think that you should be warm when you go to sleep, uh, but actually your body needs to cool down. So it's most appropriate to have your thermometer set between 60 and 67 degrees. Um, it sounds really chilly, mm -hmm. but it's really great for sleeping and it's better for your body. And the light thing is really important, especially as we age. We don't, our, our eyes don't allow us to take in the amount of light that's needed to help set our circadian clock. Um, so we, we, we are tending to not sleep as well as we age. So exposing yourself to the morning light, um, going outside and taking in the sunshine. Uh, and then at night, again, it's, it's important to lower the lights. You know, the same kind of theory, kind of follow the sun. Um, lower lights in the evening, brighten them in the morning, and it just helps your, your body set a regular cycle. It's all biology. It is. Yeah. It's all science. Susan also teaches the Sleepless in Nebraska program, which focuses more in-depth on what sleep is and why we need it. For more information on the program and this topic, you can visit go.unl.edu forward slash sleepless. We've got a link to it on the Market Journal website as well. Moving on, and it's time to get a look at the markets. On Wednesday, we were joined by Tradeoffs' Doug Simon, and we had a lot to ask him, including is now the right time for producers to start locking in some of their input costs? And how should some farmers be confronting market risk as Phase 1 and USMCA get rolling? But we started off by asking just how the Wuhan coronavirus has impacted the markets and commodities. Yeah, it's been a little quiet. I mean, the market's still been pretty volatile, but maybe not quite as much concern over the coronavirus. I think everybody's trying to figure out how, how deadly it's going to be. I mean, for lack of a better word, I mean, SARS and MERS, those were pretty, you know, pretty deadly. And right now it's not quite that, you know, to that degree. Um, but I think everybody's trying to figure that out and it's got a longer inc incubation period. So it's really, it's really an uncertain thing. So we've had, you know, a lot of volatility, especially last, you know, Friday, and then Monday, Tuesday of this week, quite a bit of concern over it, but seemed to be less concern over it today than there had been. Uh, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to the uh, upcoming WASDE report here in a couple of weeks. Uh, what, what, what kind of projections do you have for that? Well, we had the January report, which was pretty big report, but not a lot of changes in there other than like that Catalan, you know, the feed numbers that, you know, were actually boosted up, which made some sense now finally to me. But for the February report and the, you know, I don't think they'll really adjust a whole lot in there, probably internationally, Argentina, Brazil. Argentina yields on soybeans have been coming in better than expected. It's been a touch dry in Argentina, but there's some rain slated to be there. So I think it'll be more international kind of, you know, adjustments there. And really March 30th, you know, the end of the year, or end of the, um, the, the quarter there, they'll have stocks again, they'll have acres. That'll be, I think, probably bigger, uh, more interesting information on that, that March 30th uh, report as we go uh, out there toward the end of the first quarter. All right. So, uh Moving on to trade, uh, this week uh, USDA announced the uh, a sizable sale of corn to Mexico for the 2019-2020 uh, marketing year. Uh, are we starting to see the positive effects of the USMCA Act, even though it hasn't fully gone into effect yet? I think they just maybe signed that today, today which is yeah. good. And then, so you know, I was looking at some of the numbers. Uh, Mexico was actually down last year on their corn crop, like 10% from what it was the previous year. So they. We, our exports are up about 5%, should be up about 5%, which is good. So, so part of it's, you know, what's going on domestically there. You know, I think we were worried maybe longer term they might try to shift more corn to Argentina or Brazil or something like that. So I think, the, I think it is good that they've got that signed. And Mexico's been, you know, with Japan have been our two largest corn export markets. And, and actually Mexico's outpacing Japan now, you know, pretty well. So it, it, it is positive that we've got that taken care of and moving on to uh, hopefully some other bilateral trade negotiations too. So we'll move on to risk management. Um, what, what advice would you have for people as far as production risk uh, that producers should be focusing on this time of year? That's a good question because it's the time of the year that, that uh, my colleagues and I at, at Tradeos, we always start looking at making new crop sales in this, what you consider to be a kind of a seasonally favorable time frame. You know, they've done a lot of work at Iowa State University and the University of Illinois, how, what's the best marketing strategy? And typically you wanna sell 
increments you know between February and June and that's what we like to do and so we've already made a couple increments this year you know we had some opportunities last summer and then back in October when corner rally but you know Dees corn right now this week's back down to 394 last week we were back up to 404 beans were 980 you know three weeks ago and now they've fallen off um, you know quite a bit from where they were uh, but we're in that season where we always like to look at pre-harvest marketing strategies because 75% of the time you tend to go lower into the fall and so we want to be making those increments like we did last year and like we've done in the years past but that average pr price last year was four dollars in the in the spring basically from February 15th to June 15th and so whenever there's strength in there we like to sell and that's what we're looking at we're not going to sell all of our crop but we will look at our crop insurance guarantee mm -hmm. because you've got revenue kind of coverage and production coverage implicit in that and then you know start making uh, sales relative to that that uh, crop insurance guarantee and you know that's a very sound marketing strategy we always look at locking in futures ahead of time we'll trade basis and carry you know next fall when we know a little more about the crop size and what those spreads are going to be like and what the the basis or what those basis opportunities are because like right now you know our basis levels we've been talking the last several times we've met is that basis levels have been very hot yep. <laughs> and columbus has been 10 to 12 over here recently and uh, on the corn side blair's been up in that 10 over the bean basis is now 20 under in lincoln uh, we had been 70 under at one time during harvest and with 25 cents a carry that was almost like a dollar under the the march where we are now mm -hmm. and we're like 20 under so that's been an 80 cent improvement of the basis so there's, we'll look at those basis levels later on, but you know, we're definitely looking at new crop strategies at this point and how to start protecting ourselves because if we do come out with more acres like some of the commercials are projecting, the corn prices could be a lot lower this next year versus where they are right now. Very well. And so uh, earlier this week, uh, we had diesel fuel and uh, fertilizer prices take a little bit of a dip. So uh, how would you advise that producers uh, look at locking in some of their input costs? Well, we had the, when they, the, Soleimani and Iran was killed. Mm -hmm. Oil prices jumped up to $61 that Sunday night on the markets. Now we're back down toward 50, 51. So we've dropped, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks a, a barrel. When you, when you look at those cash, like the diesel fuel prices, they've come down quite a bit. So it looks like a good place to start locking in fuel because we've had a break in price, but also the seasonals, those same seasonals that we look at corn, you know, as you look at new crop corn being negative going into the summer, the diesel prices are actually positive or they increase as we go from January into April. So it makes some sense to lock down, you know, start locking down diesel for irrigation needs, transportation, you know, for people that are, um, you know, for plant, you know, for, we're in a dry land country, or non-irrigated country in Eastern Nebraska, we don't have the irrigation needs, but across the state, that's a big deal in terms of locking down diesel for their, for the irrigation needs for summertime. Thanks to Doug. Next week, we'll be joined by Mississippi State University livestock economist, Josh Maples. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass that question along. And it's time for this week's trivia question. With the Super Bowl this week, we figured this one would be kind of appropriate. Let's see if you know it. Forget about tossing around the pigskin. The hides of about four steers make up how many footballs? Is the answer A, 51, B, 64, C, 72, or is it D, 88? Make your guess and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. Moving on, Jim O'Rourke has deep roots planted along Shadron Creek on a family ranch where he and his wife Laura have lived since 1988. Both Dawes County ranchers had professional careers in range management that have taken them all over the world. But the ranch where they're raising their two children, Seth and Shannon, has always been their passion and a testing ground for the stewardship practices they've embraced. You can read about the O'Rourke's and the Rujodin Ranch in the February Nebraska Farmer. Well, last year we found out just how unforgiving the weather can be at times. That's why a weather-ready farm certification program is currently being designed and aims to improve or increase resilience toward the impacts of extreme weather on Nebraska's farms. This program will recognize and reward farmers who prioritize weather readiness and are committed to reducing the impact of extreme weather events. The Weather Ready Farm Certification Program will be a one or two year program and will be delivered locally or regionally with local or regional extension faculty and staff coordinating the program and communicating with participants. Throughout the certification program experience, participants will learn through face-to-face -face and online teaching methods. Essentially what we've come up with is we've come up with a, a self-assessment um, that, that a producer can use to look at their farm, um, go through certain steps, say, am I doing this, yes or no? Things that they've built on, they've done, they've reached a certain level of, I've done 
practices A, B, and C. Here, let's go take a look. Let's go around. We're seeing you're doing this on your farm. Great. Now we can hopefully provide some sort of certification or certification benefit to that farm who um, might be, you know, weather ready, right? More, you know, resilient to those losses and essentially is a lower risk farm. Um, we think there's some societal benefit to that. We think there might be benefit to other businesses, other entities. Um, we're, we're not sure yet where we're going to go at, at that point, but uh, right now we're looking mostly at the farming practices that increase that resilience. And, but we think there's a, a larger benefit to a farm being more resilient in addition to the farmer reducing their losses. If you'd like to learn more or participate in the Weather Ready Farm Certification Program, you can find more information at weather-ready.unl.edu or you can contact Tyler directly at tyler.williams at unl.edu. And speaking of being weather ready, it's time for a check of the weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, we've seen things settle down a little bit more this week. How's the week ahead shaping up? Well, Bill, yes, we did have some fairly benign weather outside of eastern Nebraska. We caught a couple of those systems that are moving to the south of us. Not a lot of precipitation, but just enough to make the roads just an absolute nightmare on the travels to work. We did actually see a little break from the cold here in the eastern part of the state during the midweek period and got a taste of what some of the temperatures in western Nebraska have been like here lately. So we are very welcome for that. And I, one thing I will say, the first part of this forecast looks absolutely gorgeous. After that, things fall apart rather fast. So go out and enjoy this weekend. It may be a few days before we see these type of temperatures again. So let's take a look at the surface map first of all. First. And you can see there's a powerful storm coming in the Pacific Northwest and that's pushing a ridge downstream. So we're going to see some very warm temperatures out west, potentially making it to the 70 degree mark right along the Kansas-Nebraska border in southwest Nebraska, 60s here in eastern Nebraska, surface lows to our north, high pressure over the central Rockies, nothing in the way of any moisture making it into our region. So a very nice day. It might be a little bit of windy. And then as we go into Sunday, we're going to see that trough start to dig in the west pushing up some southwesterly flow into our region with low pressure uh, developing in west central Kansas. We're still going to have a nice warm day here across the majority of the state. We'll be paying attention to that trough and it may actually start to push that cold front through as we get into Sunday night into Monday. The trough will deepen and it kind of splits away from the northern stream. So we do have a, low, a surface low located in the Texas panhandle that will try to push moisture up into our region and we should start to see some good organized precipitation over the central Rockies with some lighter snow moving out into western Nebraska and then on Tuesday that trough starts to make its way toward the eastern United States and the surface low will start to eject out in front of it into the mid-Tennessee River Valley and that will have an expensive area of precipitation with some snow on the backside. It looks like accumulating snow will be primarily in Kansas and the southern border counties and then all of those systems push toward our east as we get on Wednesday as high pressure firmly in control from the southern plains through the mid central plains a little bit of flurry activity and that's really into early wednesday morning this will all pass to our east and we'll be looking at another reinforcing shot of cold air on the back side of it unfortunately so even though we do warm up in the midweek period we're going to rapidly come to a crashing close as we get toward the end of the week as another low pressure starts to form in texas and most of the precipitation though will stay to the north of us so even though we'll see a cooler trend it doesn't look like a lot of precipitation with us and then we'll get some reinforcing shots of cooler air but not arctic air as a series of low pressure stack up to the northwest of us and that'll be the primary focus of major precipitation across the northern plains and toward the Great Lakes. We'll wait to see whether or not the next storm system has an impact next weekend but right now it does look like there is some hints some Arctic air moving into our region. So overall you know looking at a fairly nice weekend and then we start to see the typical winter weather with cooler conditions farther out we still keep that cold pocket into the western United States. So that is going to be the focus of additional energy that will move out into the period from Thursday, next Thursday to the following Tuesday. And in terms of precipitation, with an ejection of another low, high probability we'll see above normal moisture in the northern plains, potentially into western Nebraska. So overall, not a bad forecast, Bill. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and in honor of the Super Bowl, this week we asked, how many footballs can be made from the hides of about four steers? The answer is C, 72. Touchdown indeed. Well, it's that time of year again. The Nebraska legislature is back in session, and once again, the issue on how to handle Nebraska's ever-inflating property tax is going to be a hot-button topic for senators and constituents alike. Nebraska's Legislative Revenue Committee announced it's been working on property tax relief proposal LB 974. The bill could increase state aid to schools by $500 million over a three-year period, 
The committee's chairwoman, State Senator Luann Linehan, says this is an issue that's been a constant dilemma. We're increasing state aid to reduce the reliance on property taxes, which we've all heard for several years. Nebraska depends too heavily on property taxes to fund public K-12 education. So this is an effort to switch that so there's more state aid and less reliance on property taxes. Introduced by the Revenue Committee on January 13th, LB 974 has already made it through the first round of committee hearings. The legislation addresses school funding and at what levels property should be valued. Under the bill, property currently valued at 90% of actual value for purposes of taxes levied by school districts would be lowered to 85% for 2022 and following years. However, this is a four-year plan and adjustments may be needed. Every school district's valuations are going to change, so this is a four-year plan. So we have to guess how much valuations are going to go up and down over the next four years. We have to guess what their needs are going to be. And we don't guess, that's a bad term. But we have to estimate, and the people that do this have been doing it for a number of years, but it's still estimations. So that's why we have the transition aid in there to make sure if our estimates are off a little bit, we have money to make them whole. To put the problem in perspective, taxes enforced on Nebraska properties have gone up by more than $100 million every year in the current century. Past solutions included a property tax credit fund that has the state pay what people would owe. Currently, that fund is spending $275 million a year. Now, this is a subject we'll be keeping an eye on in the coming weeks as the legislative session draws to a close. And speaking of coming to a close, that's going to do it for this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, many next-generation farmers are offering agricultural custom work in order to supplement farm income. We'll share some things to consider if you plan to operate this type of add-on enterprise. Plus, we'll offer some recommendations for spring fertilizer decisions. All that and a whole lot more next week. I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.